Okay, good morning. Hope everyone is doing well. Hard to believe we're in the last week of classes. Unbelievable. Well, 2020, okay, so we want to do some exam review. A couple of things to talk about first, and, um, and then we'll get right into it. So uh, first thing, um, got another cartoon to share for you. Uh, with you, uh, another Calvin Hobbes, he says, uh, oh good, a true or false test. Alas, some clarity, every sentence is either pure, sweet truth, or a vile, contemptible lie, one or the other, nothing in between. He doesn't know what to do, so he flips a coin. Anyway, thought you might like that one. So uh, I just wanted to say, uh, so our exam is on um, Wednesday, I believe. Uh, and uh, so for next week, I will have some drop-in office hours. And uh, so it will be uh, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. I have just uh, have a Zoom call Thursday, sorry. I'm thinking I have other exams between now and then, so I'm thinking about the other ones a little bit more. <laughs> um, so uh, I will have office hours though, uh, each day, uh, Monday to Wednesday at uh, 10 to 10.30 a.m. on Zoom. I'm gonna put a link up on Moodle and uh, you can just drop in any time in those hours, or if you want to make an appointment, that's fine as well. I can certainly find the time. So uh, if you're needing any help next week, make advantage, take advantage of that. So uh, I just want to go back to this here, um, because there's one thing that I forgot to tell you on Tuesday, is that um, for this time around, I will need to see photo ID. And uh, so uh, it's important uh, that you do show your photo ID so that I can, I know that the right person is taking the test. Um, I know that some people may not have Keanu ID. Uh, you should get it. Um, but uh, if you don't have Keanu ID, you can use some other photo ID like a driver's license. Um, thing with a driver's license, it has other private information on there. So if you wanna just put a piece of tape over your address and stuff, I. I probably shouldn't be privy to that information. Um, I would prefer that you, you put a piece of tape over your, your address and if there's anything else personal in there, like you don't want me to know how tall you are, <laughs> you, can, you can tape that up too. But it should show your name and photo. That's what I need to see. So, uh, but uh, if you don't have your Cano ID, you should, you should get that because you will need it for other things, at least uh, if not now, in the future. And uh, it may be a requirement for your other exams. Um, I know I've been asked uh, to make sure that uh, I do check ID for all my exams. I'm not sure what is true of, uh, of uh, all the courses in the, in the nursing department. So uh, just a reminder of the topics we're going to look at uh, today. Um, we had uh, topics 11 to 14. And uh, what I had sent to you the other day was uh, all these uh, study questions. And uh, so what I've done is uh, I've kind of picked one or two from every topic. And uh, I uh, also have a few that people have emailed to me. So we're gonna look at that and uh, please feel free to put some comments uh, or questions as we go along. And uh, cause uh, you know, what I wanna do is make sure that I'm offering clarification on these things for you. And uh, so do make sure that um, uh, that, uh, like I said, you ask lots of questions and, and hopefully there's time at the end for other questions as well. So let's get into this. These are all the questions. Like I said, I emailed them on Tuesday. So check your email box, your Canon email if you haven't done so. And uh, one other note is I will send out, uh, I'm hoping to send out the exam instructions um, tomorrow uh, so that people have a little bit of time to take a look at it. Uh, it shouldn't be too different from the midterms. Okay. So let's get right into this. Um, topic 11 was uh, epidemiology and disease transmission. And you see the question I'm looking at, it says, what four factors contribute to nosocomial infections? So of course you need to know what that means. A nosocomial infection is a hospital or healthcare acquired infection. Um, and uh, depending where you are geographically, they may give it different names, but uh, Seems to me from what I've learned in Canada, we're using nosocomial a little bit more than hospital or healthcare acquired. Um, I could be wrong, but uh, that seems to be what uh, I picked up from public health anyway. So what, oh, I guess I already said that, what a nosocomial infection is. And uh, 
also known as hospital or healthcare acquired infections. And uh, I'll just direct you to this uh, particular diagram here as uh, factors that contribute to these kind of infections. So four things, pathogens uh, present in the hospital. So hopefully that makes sense. There's sick people there and they've brought their germs with them. Uh, patients are immunocompromised. Uh, there's a lot of old people and uh, sick people and people under getting surgery or, or other treatments that may compromise their immune system. Uh, other patient staff and equipment may be vectors. So catheters, for example, are possibly the number one cause of hospital acquired infections. Uh, you know, something relatively invasive and uh, introducing something to your urinary system that was not there before. Somebody's asking if I have this PowerPoint on Moodle. No, I don't. Um, if you remind me after class, I can share it. I, um, I, I basically finished it, putting it together five minutes ago. So didn't have time to post it. And last one is invasive procedures. I guess that's kind of similar to number three, but, uh, but it's different. Um, someone is asking, when given a question, should we define the thing before being asked to address the question? Depends on the question is, right? Uh, if, if the question, uh, you know, words like describe or define uh, is helpful. Uh, and if, that say, if it says describe, then you do want to kind of get into that category. If it just says give four examples or give two examples of something, then um, you don't need to explain what it is, right? So another one that uh, I think this was on the exam last year and it confused a number of people. And this is also one of the study questions. It says, what are the four sources of pathogens? And uh, what I'm talking about are the reservoirs of infection. So what a reservoir is, is where the pathogen kind of normally lives um, naturally, you know, out in the world kind of thing, right? Um, and uh, there were four, four sources of that. A lot of people, when they said four sources of, of uh, pathogens, they gave me four body parts. Um, and that would be uh, something different. That would be where microorganisms live on your body. So what were the reservoirs? Hopefully everybody has good examples of these by now. Uh, one reservoir is your normal flora. So you can um, uh, have an organism that is, uh, is fine and healthy to you, but then it gets introduced to the wrong location. So a classic example of that, of course, is a urinary tract infection by E. coli going from the good place to the bad place. Uh, other humans, so many diseases fall into this category. Sexually transmitted infections uh, are a good example, but uh, not, not including just sexually transmitted infections, all sorts of things like the common cold. Uh, animals, so some infections are zoonotic, we're getting from animals. So West Nile virus is a good example of that. That is a bird virus, and it gets transmitted to us uh, accidentally through mosquitoes. Uh, rabies is another good example of that as well. And then abiotic, so non-living sources. So we're, we're mostly talking about water and soil. Uh, so a lot of the Clostridium, Clostridium uh, tetani, and Clostridium botulinum are soil organisms, and uh, cholera is actually lives uh, naturally in, in water sources in some areas, and uh, so they're not coming from any of the other sources. They're all abiotic sources. So make sure you know examples of those. Like I said, I had I know I had a question last year, and a number of people kind of just didn't quite understand what I meant by sources of pathogens, meaning where do they come from? Uh, somebody wanted me to talk about this one here a little bit. Um, and didn't really have time to make a slide, but uh, I could write on the slide, handy dandy pin. Um, so it says here, how is legionosis unique from other waterborne infections? So I started making a table. This is about as far as I got. And uh, so we can start off here with uh, cause. There we go. And uh, so legionellosis is caused by legionella. And uh, the main one is uh, Legionella pneumophila, I think is how you say it. And uh, other waterborne infections, well, there's a huge, huge list, but I'll put a few on there. So we've got uh, things like E. coli, all, you know, anything that can be fecally uh, transmitted. So E. coli, Salmonella, uh, Giardia, Hepatitis A, uh, norovirus, uh, the list goes on and on and on. 
Um, but uh, I think kind of the main things to talk about is transmission and symptoms. Transmission. So most of these other waterborne infections, we're looking at uh, fecal matter, right? And fecal matter in water. Maybe I should put drinking water. Or food, I guess, right? It's kind of related. Um, Legionella is uh, transmitted in, um, in uh, a mist and aerosols, right? So uh, aerosolized water. Not sure if I quite spelt that right. I feel like I used to be good at spelling. Uh, somewhere along the way, I've, uh, you know, I've been, been losing that talent. <laughs> I guess spell checkers make us lazy. So aerosolized water. Uh, so we're looking at uh, you know hot tubs being a big source, uh, hot tubs that uh, people have been a little lazy putting the chemicals in. Uh, sometimes there's other sources like um, I'm not exactly sure how these things work, but uh, uh, in large buildings, air conditioners have these cooling towers, and like I said, I don't really know how they work. Uh, I don't really know much about them, not being an engineer, but apparently it, it creates a lot of mist and. Uh, and the Legionella can, can live in that. So you're looking at a different type of transmission, right? People aren't drinking the Legionella. In fact, I think if you drink Legionella, it's not gonna cause you any symptoms, um, but you're getting it in your lungs. So symptoms is kind of the other big thing, right? And uh, so symptoms for Legionella is uh, basically a type of uh, pneumonia. So I'll say pneumonia-like symptoms, pneumonia, pneumonia-like illness. Uh, most other waterborne infections, you're looking at gastrointestinal things. So we're looking at uh, diarrhea and vomiting. So two T's and vomiting or one? Hmm. So that's kind of the big thing, right? And uh, so, I'm not sure about in Canada because it's, sometimes it's hard to find those numbers on that. And when people talk about waterborne infections, they really are focusing on the usual suspects. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, things transmitted in, in feces. Um, but, uh, but it's, you know, Legionella in Canada, or at least in the States, is pretty common. And it actually uh, is more common than other waterborne infections, but uh, kind of, you know, unrelated because it's not uh, transmitted by fecal matter. Um, someone is asking a question about organisms found in specific areas of the microbiome. Uh, you know, it's always good to know an example uh, or two from, from every area that we talked about in the course. Uh, so, you know, don't worry about learning all of them, but, uh, you know, um, kind of, you know, if you think about the, the microbiome, uh, the main areas are the skin and the digestive system, right? So the skin, Staphylococcus, uh, the digestive tract, uh, you got the stomach helical tractor and uh, the, uh, 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 the intestines E. coli. And, and so that's not too bad, a good place to start. Um, some of the other organisms that we talked about, like, uh, like uh, yeast, so uh, candida, uh, you know, it's found all over the place in both of those locations and also found um, in, the, uh, in the vagina as well. Um, so, you know, like I said, always good to know a few examples. All right, next question. It says, compare and contrast um, Lyme disease and West Nile fever. So again, I didn't really have time to do all this. I started putting together a little table we can fill out here. And uh, so of course, each of these have uh, different causes. Uh, so Lyme disease is ca caused by a bacteria. Oh, I can't, uh, my pen's not working again. There we go, let's try that again. This is a bacteria. And uh, hold on, I'm just going to let somebody in here. So the bacteria is called Borrelia. So B O R. This one I do know how to spell. Borrelia. And I used to know the. the um, I used to know the uh, origin of the name. Um, 
of this. I can't remember what Borrelia is, but Berg de Fori is actually some guy's name. So his last name. Interesting last name. I don't know what origin that is, um, but uh, interesting anyway. So there's the name of the bacterium. That's a spirochete. So here I'll draw a little, little spirochete shape there. And West Nile fever is, of course, caused by West Nile virus. So West Nile virus. So sometimes you see abbreviations, right, for viruses. People like acronyms. I'm not a big fan of acronyms myself, but um, once in a while they're useful. Uh, so transmission, Lyme disease, is transmitted by ticks. So if you remember what type of tick, it's called the black-legged tick. Black-legged ticks. And there were actually two species in Canada of black, um, <clears throat> excuse me, legged ticks. Uh, one of them was called, caused uh, just the black-legged tick. Um, the one uh, that's west of the Rockies, I think, is called the western black-legged tick. And uh, somebody is asking about deer tick. Yeah, so deer tick is a common name for these things as well. So deer tick, that here as well. There's also a few other names uh, for these ticks, um, kind of regional names. I think uh, I, I, was, I was reading somewhere that uh, it was Montana. They call them bear ticks, maybe. And um, I've heard other people say uh, um, lime tick as well, um, but uh, deer tick is probably the second most common name after black-legged tick. Um, yeah, so spelling on things on, on exams, you know, as long as I kind of, as long as I know what it is, that's helpful. Um, you know, if I'm not sure, that's not helpful either. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's a tough one, right? And so, uh oh what just happened there? There we go. Uh, you know, kind of depends on what I'm asking for, right? Uh, so that's one that probably I would design the questions around, you know, having to name that one in particular because I know it's hard to spell and, and all that. Uh, West Nile fever is, uh, is spread by uh, the Culex mosquitoes. So the Culex mosquitoes, uh, I'm trying to think of what their common names are. It's something like the house mosquito or something like that. Um, but you just need to know that they're spread by mosquitoes. Uh, it's something I don't have on here, which maybe I will squeeze in way up at the top, is the reservoir of these diseases. So for Lyme disease, we're looking at white-footed mice. Are the main animal source in West Nile fever, we're looking at birds. So a whole bunch of species of birds. Common robins are, uh, are, pretty, uh, are pretty common, um, but uh, we're looking at all sorts of birds, uh, cardinals, crows, uh, you name it. Someone is mentioning uh, the name of the mosquito, a northern house mosquito. There's actually a couple of different types of Culex mosquitoes. Uh, one in eastern Canada is more, more common, and then one in western Canada is more common. I can't remember the, the western one either. It's uh, more associated with agriculture. I think somebody else uh, had a question here. No, maybe not. Okay. Uh, symptoms. So Lyme disease, uh, a big part of Lyme disease. Um, so Western encephalitis mosquito. Yeah, I thought it had another name, something to do with like farm mosquito or something like that, but I honestly can't remember. But let's get on to symptoms. So Lyme disease, a uh, big one, of course, is the bullseye rash. Bullseye rash. And uh, that's maybe 80, 85% of people get that. Um, sometimes people get kind of aches, so we'll call that maybe arthritis-like symptoms. Those are kind of the main ones. Uh, I kind of don't really want to get into all the Lyme, Lyme disease stuff when you're looking at people get longer term cases. Uh, sometimes people get uh, 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 Bell's palsy, and in some uh, long-term cases, we're looking at even uh, severe things like heart palpitations and whatnot. But kind of those are the main ones that people might get up front, main symptoms. Uh, I think uh, fever is not that common. Whereas West Nile fever, you could imagine we're getting fever. So we'll say flu-like symptoms. 
So what are the flu-like symptoms? We have fever, aches, fatigue. And the other one uh, is, uh, that is not common for flu, but encephalitis. By the way, interesting thing about encephalitis, uh, generally in Canada and the US we say encephalitis, Apparently in the UK, they like to say encephalitis. Um, and I think that has something to do with the original Greek word. Um, that, that's actually probably a proper pronunciation. So you might hear both encephalitis or encephalitis. Just a little note on that for you. So Lyme disease, uh, the main treatment is, um, is antibiotics, so antibacterials. I think the common one is doxycycline, but I don't think we talked about that one. Uh, and, uh, you know, people with longer term symptoms, again, you're treating the symptoms and, and all that and don't want to get into long term uh, Lyme disease uh, right now. Uh, West Nile fever, uh, usually you're treating the symptoms and uh, you might, uh, and that's about it, right? So we're not treating the virus, so treating the symptoms. So most people, it's relatively mild and you're looking at Tylenol and those kind of things. Uh, if you're uh, concerned and if somebody kind of older or an adult, and there's indications of encephalitis, uh, they might give you some sort of steroids to kind of uh, reduce the swelling because that can be fatal when the brain is swelling and has nowhere to swell to because of, of the skull. Okay, so I don't know if there's any more questions about that, but I'm going to move on. Uh, question 12. I've had a few people email me about this one here. Um, this one's actually a pretty straightforward kind of question, right? Uh, it's basically the scenario where you have an organism going from one body location to another anatomical site. And so of course in the intestine, uh, that's where E. coli should be. And everything's all good and we're all happy. Um, and of course, uh, if there's an intestinal puncture, now you can end up with bacteremia in the blood. And, uh, and of course that can be a, a fatal kind of infection. So uh, like I said, that one is just rel should be relatively straightforward. Just just got to stop and think for one minute, that's all. So uh, this type of infection, by the way, is called an opportunistic infection. And uh, there's a, a number of uh, scenarios we talked about in lecture about opportunistic infections and, and where they can be caused. Um, and I just want to uh, you know, point out what those are, because I think again, I don't know, it was last year, the year before, I asked about opportunistic infections and uh, a lot of people were giving me, um, you know, I think I asked for two examples. A lot of people were giving me two examples of the exact same thing. Um, so sometimes opportunistic infections are because people have a weakened immune system. So think about somebody with AIDS. Um, they're getting affected by things that uh, the rest of us have, those organisms on our body, and they're not causing pneumonia or anything like that. But someone with AIDS, uh, their immune system is weakened and they're susceptible to things that norm the rest of us kind of just, uh, you know, have no problem dealing with. Uh, there's also altered microbiota. Uh, so the scenario where you take antibiotics for some reason or another, and it disrupts your, um, the profile of the, of the bacteria in your gut, and you end up with, uh, you know, many cases, uh, C. diff, right? So that's another scenario. Um, breached barrier, so we mentioned that with E. coli here, organism getting to a new anatomical site. And then other complications, and other complications include all sorts of things out there. And uh, I think one of the complications I mentioned was like cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder where people have extra thick mucus in their lungs. And so they're uh, extra susceptible to getting certain types of lung infections that can be uh, fatal to them. Uh, whereas the rest of us, uh, you know, they're, they're non-fatal infections. So uh, I've also had a couple of people ask, uh, you know, kind of generally, uh, what do we need to know about pathogenic E. coli? There's a whole bunch of different types. They have different acronyms and all sorts of different names. So I, I made a list of, of what I think are some of the most important concepts to know about pathogenic E. coli, okay? Uh, you don't need to know the difference between EHEC and EPEC and ETEC and all those kind of things, right? Um, the point I was trying to make about those is that they're pathogenic, and uh, actually, this is one of the main points right here. Oh, come on. You're telling me I use my pen and wants to change the slide. There we go. It's one of the main points, right? 
between the different ones. They're pathogenic, um, not because they're E. coli. Most E. coli is not pathogenic, but the pathogen ones are that way because they have extra virulence factors. And those virulence factors include things like enterotoxins or sometimes pili that allow them to attach to uh, certain tissues. Uh, so what else do I have on here? Uropathogenic E. coli are certain strains that can cause um, uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, most of the other pathogenic E. coli are gastrointestinal infections. So the, uh, the main uh, symptoms, of course, are diarrhea and uh, sometimes um, dysentery, so bloody diarrhea uh, for the, some of the really nasty ones. And um, the really nasty one is this one here. So if you want to know the name of one pathogenic E. coli, uh, that one there has a chance of being on the final. That's 0157, and that's the really nasty one that causes bloody diarrhea, in some cases death, with a whole bunch of toxins. And uh, most of the uh, pathogenic E. coli are spread through human fecal matter. Uh, this is the one that is, uh, um, the contamination is from cow manure, and so it has a different source. And it doesn't seem to make the cow sick, which is kind of interesting uh, there in general. Um, and then kind of another footnote here, there's other E. coli infections, and it's just a matter of the being in the wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. So like you can get pneumonia from E. coli apparently. Uh, not very common, but uh, it can happen. So another question someone forwarded to me, they were wondering, uh, you know, what was the difference between all of these things here? Um, so of course they have, um, there are, diseases that are from different bacteria. So uh, the names of the bacteria, the first two are Clostridium organisms and found in the soil. So botulism is from Clostridium botulinum. If I can spell this one right. That looks correct. And tetanus is from Clostridium tetani. That looks right too. Uh, cholera is from Vibrio cholera. I think the organism is spelt like that. So all of these here are, um, so Vibrio cholera is kind of a bent rod, so it kind of looks like that. And all, and these other ones are just rods. Um, these are gram positives, endospore formers. There's my endospores and uh, cholera is, is uh, gram negative. Um, and the toxins themselves so have different effects, right? So botulism can cause paralysis. So it, it can be local paralysis, of course, so we have Botox, which is um, you know, used to paralyze in very, very tiny muscles and tiny, tiny areas for either therapeutic or cosmetic reasons. Uh, tetanus will actually, um, I'm not sure what the term is, but it, it locks muscles, I'll say. So it prevents uh, muscle relaxation, which is why sometimes tetanus is called lockjaw, because uh, of course, you know, that means, you know, you know, it's affecting that part of your body. And cholera causes uh, a very, very, very watery diarrhea. You can dehydrate and die within 24 hours. And so rehydration is kind of one of the main treatments from cholera. So different, uh, different endotoxins, or sorry, exotoxins, and uh, you know different causes and different effects. Okay, so um, this is what I wanted to cover in a lot of detail today. It's going to get back to the immune system and talk about uh, the different types of immunity. So we've got humoral immunity here and cell mediated immunity. So this is part of the adaptive immune system. So we're talking about antibodies here. And uh, so what I've done is I've started making some tables here and uh, I'm gonna fill in the details. Um, so this one here, I, usually I do this one on the board. So I'm a little bit slower. So if I'm going too fast, please do slow me down. So humoral immunity, cell mediated immunity. And remember what we're doing is we're talking about different types of uh, immune cells. So B cells and T cells. The official name of course is B lymphocyte and T lymphocyte but you can say B cell or T cell, right? So remember the difference between these things, B stands for bone marrow and T is for thymus. And so this is where these uh, cells mature 
and by maturing, uh, I'm talking about clonal deletion, right? So maybe I'll put a note there, clonal deletion. So clonal deletion is where our body eliminates uh, extra cells. And uh, basically our body is pumping out a whole bunch of these things and they can recognize all sorts of different antigens. And so what our, our body does in the bone marrow and the thymus is eliminates, eliminate the ones that may be reactive to self. Because uh, of course we don't want our immune system attacking our body. And it usually works most of the time. Once in a while people have autoimmune issues, but uh, most of the time it works really, really well. So next question is, uh, you know, type of pathogen or substance recognized. So if you think about the, um, the B uh, cells, they are secreting antibodies and these things are usually going to get destroyed by phagocytosis, which might be on the next slide. Um, and so we're talking about uh, uh, things that are freely circulating. So viruses, uh, bacteria, uh, some other small cells. So I think about the biggest size might be a yeast cell. A lot of pathogens might be too big, uh, protists and whatnot. And then large molecules, uh, so toxins. So for example, diphtheria toxin or tetanus toxin, um, our immunity is actually against the toxins and those can be uh, neutralized by the antibodies. The cell mediated immunity, uh, we talked about three things, but really these are things that are too large to be uh, um, destroyed by phagocytosis. And so we're looking at uh, large parasites such as parasitic worms. Um, obviously other large cells, there are a lot of other large protists that are too big to be destroyed by uh, phagocytosis. Uh, virus infected cells. So our cells get infected by a virus. Our own cells are too big to be destroyed by phagocytosis, but they start to make glycoproteins that are unique and recognized by the immune system. And so uh, T cell immunity can be very, very strong, which is something that we're hoping to have with our, our new vaccine against COVID-19 is T cell immunity because it's, uh, it's very, very strong. Uh, tumor cells, so uh, cells that are becoming cancerous, they start to look different and our immune system can recognize them. And one that I didn't talk in class, about in class, or maybe I mentioned it in passing, was that uh, transplant tissues. So if you um, get a transplant uh, and it's not compatible, um, it's this part of the immune system that will attack it. Okay, so uh, what else do I have here? I know I have some more things on the other slide. Uh, so what happens when the cells are activated? So how is the pathogen killed? And how does the immune system remember the pathogen? So humoral immunity, remember we're talking about B cells, right? And the B cells, what do they do? They secrete antibodies. And, um, and of course, uh, well, how is the pathogen killed is, is, is the next part here. And uh, they, um, um, the antibodies will often lead to phagocytosis. And I have some information on what the antibodies do here in a minute. Uh, I think that's on the next slide. But uh, often we're looking at phagocytosis is the answer to what's going on with uh, B cells after they secrete antibodies. And how does the immune system remember? Uh, of course, we've got memory cells. So those B cells differentiate. Some of them become uh, active secreting antibodies and some become uh, hopefully long-lived memory cells. Cell-mediated immunity. So we're looking at the T cells and the T cells become activated and cytotoxic. And so what does that mean? Uh, cytotoxic means they are going to kill the target pathogen. And there's a few different mechanisms behind that, which we're not going to get into in this class. As some is kind of like apoptosis. I don't know if you've heard about that or not. It's kind of basically telling a cell time to commit suicide. Um, others actually secrete toxins that will punch holes in the walls and uh, in membranes of, uh, of the target pathogens. And of course, uh, how does it remember? Memory cells are made. Um, and again, hopefully long-term memory cells. Okay, so immune system. Like I said, it's very, very complex. And um, what I want you to do is take, take a home on you know, some of these messages about you know, humoral, uh, cell-mediated immunity. There's also the innate immune system, which is barriers and all that, and all of them complement each other, okay? Um, you know, I'm not gonna ask you to write an essay on these on the final exam, but there might be some comparison or some matching or something like that, I haven't decided yet. So antibodies, I mentioned I wanted to come back to antibodies. Uh, really, I just wanted to take a look at this slide that I showed you before. So antibodies, of course, bind the antigens. 
and the antigens can be all sorts of things, bacteria, viruses, and toxins. And there's a bunch of things that happen. So one is opsonization. So that's a word to know. Opsonization basically means that something is being uh, labeled for phagocytosis, right? So you can see there's an immune cell that's been recruited and it's going to lead to phagocytosis. What else can happen? Well, some of these things are too big to be killed by, um, um, by phagocytosis, although that little bacteria in the picture looks small enough. Uh, so we look at cytotoxic killing, which you can see has a big fancy name here, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So cytotoxic killing. Uh, like I said, I kind of think of that as kind of like the kiss of death. It comes over and it, and it uh, releases some toxins. And of course, that is going to lead to the death of the pathogen. Uh, there are a few other things. Activating the complement system. And the complement system is, um, uh, we talked about it very briefly, but it's really uh, a system in the blood that uh, in some ways is designed to activate other parts of the immune system. So it's kind of like a, like a sound in the alarm in some ways. And through a number of ways, it will usually lead to um, either lysis or phagocytosis of the cell. And I don't want to really cover the complement system in a lot of details. Uh, like I said, it just takes up too much time and, and uh, you know, we can only cover so much. Uh, what else? Agglutination. So that's kind of like clumping. And that is, of course, going to usually lead to phagocytosis because uh, our immune system, the bigger something is, the easier it is to see. And then lastly, neutralization. So um, our antibodies against toxins. We have um, vaccines against uh, diphtheria toxin, tetanus toxin, and our uh, antibodies produced are strong enough to neutralize the toxin so you don't even get sick. Often though, this does lead to phagocytosis in the end. So you can see that really, uh, you know, you can think of this as five things or two things. All of these things usually lead to phagocytosis or cell lysis. And so antibodies are good and, uh, and um, help us fight a bunch of different diseases. All right, what else do I have here? Body's defenses, um, four types of vaccines and uh, with examples and two new types in trials. So the four classic types of vaccines are the attenuated, inactivated, conjugate subunit and uh, toxoid vaccines. So attenuated means weakened or something along that lines. And um, for attenuated, usually we're looking at uh, virus vaccines. And there's a bunch of different methods for attenuating viruses. Uh, some uh, are old school methods and there's a lot of new school methods too. Uh, and uh, so basically you're looking at a virus that can still replicate, but in a very, very slow way, or maybe um, there's certain genes that have been removed so it's not, as, um, it's not gonna cause disease. Uh, there still might be symptoms, usually they're really mild, and usually they're just virus-like symptoms. Our immune system might have a little bit of a fever or something like that that is, that is not actually because of the virus, it's just because our immune system recognizes a virus and that's what it does when it recognizes foreign uh, invaders uh, in our blood system. So some examples of this are all the viruses in the MMVR vaccine, so that's mumps, measles, uh, varicella, rubella. Uh, those are all attenuated uh, viruses. Uh, there's also the flu mist. I think that's the trademark name. I don't know if there's a um, common name for it, uh, but the flu mist is the, uh, uh, the one that's taken nasally for the flu. Uh, that is also attenuated. Uh, inactivated is where the uh, organism is killed, uh, sometimes using UV or chemicals, I think is the most common way to do it. And uh, so some examples of that, of course, is the flu shot. So that's the normal flu vaccine that people get. Um, I'm just trying to think of some other examples. That's kind of the main one. There's so, there's a, there's so many more attenuated ones. Um, I know that most of these other vaccines have had uh, um, killed versions. So the injectable uh, polio vaccine, of course. Polio vaccine. And the, uh, the oral polio vaccine is, uh, is attenuated. Oral polio. I think somebody has a comment here. Yeah, uh, rabies, uh, I 
believe rabies is killed, yes. And uh, polio, uh, the one that we're getting now in Canada, is the injectable one. Uh, conjugate subunit, again, there's a whole bunch of these. I think I, I had mentioned, um, my pen's not working, there we go. We've got uh, several pneumonia vaccines now, pneumonia. And those are carbohydrates. Um, we also have the, um, uh, the meningitis uh, vaccine is a conjugate one. I, I'm just trying to think of the name of the vaccine. I'll just say meningitis, I guess. Can't think of the name of the actual vaccine, but it doesn't matter. It's against a Haemophilus uh, um, organism. And there's a Neisseria one as well. There's actually two, uh, two meningitis vaccines. Um, and toxoid, so I mentioned diphtheria. And let's see if I can spell diphtheria. Oops, maybe not. Huh? Let me try that again. Yep. Yeah, I feel like something's wrong about that. Could be right. Uh, diphtheria, uh, tetanus. Uh, pertussis. There's actually two pertussis vaccines. One of them is a conjugate subunit vaccine and one is against the pertussis toxin. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure actually whether we get both now. I think they at one point had both in the shot and uh, I think they've actually switched it up now. I'd have to look that one up. Uh, and what are the two new types? So we have RNA-based vaccines. And so the idea there is that the RNA is the genetic instructions and uh, it goes into the tissues. You know, the RNA finds ribosomes, the ribosomes make virus spike proteins, and then we get immune response against the spike protein. So it's kind of like a conjugate subunit vaccine, uh, but just a little bit uh, easier to manufacture, and, uh, and like I said, a kind of a new type of technology. And we're actually seeing pretty good immune results from that. And the, the, the other one is virus-like particles. Uh, so um, the, uh, most of the technologies using this are using some sort of uh, other virus, so sometimes a virus from another species, it doesn't cause human disease. Or uh, there was another technology using, uh, I believe it was a weakened measles virus. And uh, what they do is uh, change the genetics so that that virus will express uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins instead of the uh, spike proteins from the original virus. And again, you've got a larger uh, particle and, uh, and, and there's more likely a chance that the uh, immune system will form a strong immune response and a strong, uh, not just humoral response, but we're hoping to get a cell-mediated response against viruses because viruses infect cells and we want to kill infected cells as well. Okay, how are we doing for time? We're doing all right so far. We're just kind of whizzing through these. Hopefully you're finding this useful. Like I said, feel free to ask questions or if there's you know, something you need clarified, please let me know. Uh, two types of immunodeficiencies. So remember we talked about hypersensitivities. Um, maybe I'll make a, a little thing over here. So hypersensitivities, let's talk about those first. So immune hypersensitivities, we're talking about allergic diseases. Sorry for my handwriting. I'm just trying to get this pen to work for me. It's uh, not uh, behaving on me today. So allergic diseases, so what do we mean by allergic diseases? Uh, we can talk about hay fever, allergies, uh, asthma, eczema, anaphylaxis, there's a whole bunch on there. And uh, we also have other immune uh, disorders, which are often called autoimmune diseases. And uh, autoimmune diseases. And there were a bunch of different types. I think there's, uh, uh, besides allergies, three other types. And, and I had stressed in class that you don't need to know the mechanisms behind the different types, but know some examples. So some examples are type one diabetes, Um, hemolytic uh, rejection of the newborn. Can't remember if there's a different name for that. Hemolytic. Um, feel like there's a different word other than rejection. Like 
rejection of newborn, um, lupus, which I can't remember the full name. We have a bunch of other things like, uh, um, what's it called, farmer's lung. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of these autoimmune diseases, right? And uh, this is where the immune system is attacking some tissues. Uh, so rheumatoid arthritis is another one, and I'm running out of space there. So take a look, know some examples of these, okay? Uh, immunodeficiencies, okay? Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about, um, uh, really there's two types. There's some that uh, you are, you're born with. So maybe I will call these, there's actually a term called primary. And you're born with those. And so we talked about, for example, SCIDS, which is um, was a severe combined uh, immuno disorder or something. Again, I see this is why I don't like acronyms. I can never remember what they stand for half the time. Well, that's the bubble boy disease. And I mentioned that there's a whole bunch of other primary uh, immune diseases that people, uh, a lot of people don't even know they have them because um, we have um, so many overlapping systems in our, our immune system. And uh, so sometimes what it means is, uh, uh, it means that you might be a little more susceptible to certain types of viruses. And so you just get colds a bit more often, those kind of things. And you may never know because you're never getting your, your, uh, your immune system uh, tested. Uh, so, somebody's asking about um, our primary immunodeficiencies, hypersensitivities. No, primary, uh, I'm talking about immunodeficiencies here. Uh, and immunodeficiency is not the same as a hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity is where you end up with an immune reaction that you don't want. Uh, immunodeficiency is where our um, immune system is not acting when it should. And so we're more susceptible to infections, right? Now uh, the other one is acquired. So acquired, it means you're getting them from all sorts of different reasons. You could be uh, uh, mal malnourished. Maybe you're on immunosuppressants. Uh, you know, sometimes people get organ transplants and they have to take immunosuppressants. Um, or sometimes when you're old, your immune system starts to just not be as good anymore. Uh, and there's also some from some infectious diseases, so most notably measles, and of course uh, from HIV, which causes AIDS. Okay, so know the difference between a hypersensitivity and an immunodeficiency. Uh, they are different, and know some examples. And then of course here we did focus in this unit on HIV and AIDS. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's talk a little bit about AIDS and HIV. Uh, I had a few questions about this and I can't honestly remember half of them. So if you could remind me of what some of them are what I, uh, in a minute, once I talk about what I wanna talk about. Um, some people are asking, you know, what, what we need to know about this. Uh, it's kind of like any, any unit. Um, I know there's a lot of information there. Uh, you need to know about what I focused on for sure. Um, do you need to know all about the HIV life cycle? Uh, I would say um, not entirely. It, it's good to know a little bit about it. There's kind of two th key things about HIV. One is that uh, it has a reverse transcriptase. So it's converting its RNA to uh, double-stranded DNA. And that's a target of a lot of our drugs. And the other is that it integrates into the uh, human genome, so it becomes a lifelong infection. So those are kind of uh, uh, two of the key things to take away from the HIV life cycle. So I want to talk about the disease AIDS in, in general, and I pulled up uh, directly from your notes, uh, this little graph here. And uh, if you take a look at this, the graph is uh, plotting two different things in the blue here. So this blue here line, Oh, come on. Let's go back to that. There we go. This blue line, that is the, um, uh, that is the CD4 cells, right? So those are your immune cells that are getting killed if you have uh, HIV. 
And the red line is the uh, actual number of, um, of viral particles that are found in the blood. And so you can see that uh, you know, we've, it's broken up into basically three phases. Sometimes people break it up into four or five. Um, I'll kind of conclude it as three or four, or four, four phases because um, it, it's just, again, trying to simplify things. Uh, but first is the acute phase. So sometimes we talk about acute HIV. So acute, by the way, I don't know if I ever define it over the semester. It means, um, it means quick, right? Quick and, or short or something like that is what acute means. So when we have an acute infection, it means it's something that comes and goes, right? Versus chronic, which is something that might just, you know, stay with you for a long, long time. So acute HIV is monolike, right? It's infecting the uh, uh, lymphatic tissue and it's, uh, you know, you've got your, your immune reaction is going on and you get swollen lymph nodes and, and uh, you know, sore throat and fever. So fever just from interacting with the virus. Um, and you can see that uh, the CD4 cells are kind of in that acute phase. I uh, take a bit of a hit, uh, but our body can have an immune response against HIV. And uh, at some point, the acute illness goes away after a few weeks and uh, the person feels fine or mostly fine. And at that point, the immune system is kind of keeping the, uh, the virus at bay, but slowly those immune cells are being killed. So part B is the asymptomatic phase where people don't really have much symptoms. They might be susceptible to certain types of, of uh, infections a little more than others, but for the most part, it's asymptomatic. Like I said, you can see this steady decline of their, um, of their CD4 cells and the slow, slow increase of the, um, of the virus particles. At this point, the virus is, of course, going to be, um, you know, uh, trying to mutate. And, you know, if somebody's taking only one drug and not a cocktail, it might actually get some resistance as well. So the later stages, so over here, uh, uh, sometimes we call AIDS. Uh, it kind of depends on where you are at at those symptomatic stages. Um, usually broken into two parts. You can see one, and this should be a two there. One and two. So first part is AIDS-related complex or ARC. Uh, so you can see the clinical definition, people are looking at the number of CD4 cells. So AIDS, they're saying you have less than 200 CD4 cells per microliter of blood, and ARC, it's, uh, it's higher than that. And so ARC, you're looking at uh, certain persistent opportunistic infections, um, and, uh, and whereas clinical AIDS, uh, um, you're looking at more severe clinical infections. And, you know, we're talking about a whole bunch that uh, we've talked about here, and, uh, you know, they, they tend to get worse and worse the more you're getting towards clinical AIDS. So just a reminder what some of those were, right? So we had thrush, uh, sometimes toxoplasma. Again, toxoplasma um, is not so common anymore because uh, when somebody is diagnosed with AIDS, we usually know to look for it and we can, it can be treated. Um, but it is something in there. And I mentioned also tuberculosis. And tuberculosis, again, it depends on where you live geographically. So if you're living on the African continent, uh, it's hand in hand. If you're in, in Canada, no, not so common. I never noticed this before, but three Ts, hey? Those are some big ones. Um, what else have we talked about? We talked about disseminated herpes and shingles. And we're not talking about normal herpes and shingles. We're talking about disseminated, meaning uh, rashes in all sorts of crazy parts of the body. Uh, all sorts of uh, rare pneumonias. So pneumonias by fungi that no normally don't cause uh, pneumonia. All sorts of sarcomas and cancers. I'm just going to put cancers up here that normal people don't usually get. Okay, uh, I'm trying to remember what else people had asked me about HIV and AIDS, and I really can't remember. I think somebody asked me about um, the uh, HIV vaccine. Uh, and, and why we're having problems with that. And the main reason is, is that it mutates. If you were to sample, um, you know, everybody on the planet with HIV, we're looking at millions of different viruses. And so we can't make millions of different vaccines. Uh, there have been cases where uh, I think there was a trial in Quebec where they made customized vaccines to some patients with HIV. So what they did was they uh, sampled their blood, um, cultured the virus, made a personalized vaccine, and, uh, and actually it was reasonably successful in that the person uh, 
you know, was able to mount a strong immune response. But I think it only lasted a couple of years. And the problem is that the, uh, the viruses in their system eventually mutated and became different. And uh, so that's kind of part of the problem is all the mutations. Um, but there's been, you know, some encouraging results from some large scale studies. Uh, you know, some of these vaccines, there was a large uh, trial in, uh, was it Thailand? I think it was something like 100,000 people were, were vaccinated. And, uh, uh, you know, these things sometimes take years to get the results because you can't just, you know, subject people to the virus. Uh, you got to wait and see if they get, if they uh, get exposed to it themselves. And uh, so very, very complex. And they're showing that the, the vaccine was, uh, you know, like effective, but maybe 40% effective. And usually these pharmaceutical companies are looking for things that are at least 50% effective. Um, but it's just kind of encouraging because they're like, okay, you know, maybe there's something here, you know, and, and it's really uh, forcing us to learn a lot about the immune system and, um, and maybe rethink about how we do, our, and how we do uh, vaccines in general. So we'll see what happens with that because a vaccine would be very really nice. Um, somebody's asking if there have been a few people who have had HIV and it's gone from something. Yeah, that Berlin patient. So look that one up, Google Berlin patient or uh, the London patient, and uh, you can see what that's all about. So infections of the human body. Uh, I think I had a study question asking about different types of infections caused by a few different organisms. I mentioned staph, um, probably E. coli, probably streptococcus and pseudomonas were all in there because they seem to end up in a bunch of different uh, body systems. So what I was uh, basically encouraging you to do is go through the notes and, uh, you know, as you, as you make your notes, uh, you know, think about these organisms and see where they're popping up again and again. So uh, staphylococcus. Uh, classically known for being a skin organism. And so no surprise there, it's gonna cause all sorts of skin infections and also uh, it can cause conjunctivitis. So that's infection, inflammation of the uh, surface of the eye. Uh, these were some of the skin infections we, we, we talked about or maybe we didn't talk about all of them, I can't remember now. Um, there's probably something missing there but I can't think of what it is at the moment. But uh, kind of impetigo, uh, folliculitis, uh, there's a few nastier things like scalded skin syndrome, and sometimes staphylococcus is associated with flesh-eating disease, although usually it's a streptococcus, but uh, I thought I'd throw it on there. Um, and then you've got all these other body systems, right? We can end up with sinus infections and lung infections from uh, staphylococcus. Um, it can also cause urinary tract infections. It's not the most common cause, but again, if you go through the notes, you can see it's in there as, uh, as a possible cause, and it does pop up. Uh, sometimes there is food intoxication uh, from staph. Again, not the most common cause by far, but it is possible. Uh, nervous system, it can cause uh, meningitis and other infections of the nervous system. So this thing is just uh, really all too good at causing infections of all, of all the body systems. Um, these ones are more common and more serious. Uh, so bacteremia, that means uh, infection of the blood. And of course, sometimes it causes toxic shock syndrome because some strains have that toxin, that TSS, uh, T toxin, it's called. So you can do the same uh, and take a look at uh, those other organisms I had listed in the study question. I think it was, like I said, I think it was E. coli, Pseudomonas, and maybe Streptococcus pyrogenes. Um, but take a look at that. You know, you know, all these organisms, they have their kind of usual infections, right? Uh, but then they can cause, uh, you know, all sorts of other infections here. So urinary tract infections, uh, you know, for staphylococcus, in many cases, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, um, related to uh, catheters, because of course, you know, that's an invasive procedure and, uh, um, you know, introducing uh, MRSA, so resistant uh, uh, organisms is, is not, uh, not a desired kind of thing. So I cannot recall, but I'm hoping I kind of covered most of the things that people have sent me. I know I have these, um, uh, study questions. So I think we've got about maybe 20-ish minutes left. So if anybody has something else on there they want to talk about, please let me know. Now's the time and I can pull it up. This is uh, infections of the human body. I'm just uh, looking at that one. I feel like there's something there. Yeah, there's the list of organisms. So E. coli, we talked about today, we didn't talk today about Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but uh, if you take a look at the notes on topic 14, it, it pops up again and again in all sorts of opportunistic infections. 
although it does have its typical infections, and Streptococcus pyogenes, that's the one associated with strep throat, but can also infect all sorts of other parts of the body. So fun, fun, fun. Anyway, I'm, I'm wanting to entertain any questions now, or uh, you know, we can always finish early if there's no questions, but uh, please let me know um, if you have any thoughts or you need some clarifications or anything, or just even general questions about the exam. Uh, I can entertain any of those right now. So someone has a quick question about salmonella. And uh, so it says here, um, if we had a question about its mode of transmission, would it be correct to say it has multiple modes of transmission? Um, in theory, yes, but the, the most common mode of salmonella transmission is basically fecal oral. So you're looking at fecal matter contaminating water or food. Uh, somebody's asking, what can we expect for the case studies? Uh, kind of the typical kind of questions I've done for case studies. So I'll probably pick on some of the organisms that we featured in the last few units. Um, so these ones here I just underlined are good ones. Um, we also talked a lot about um, tuberculosis, uh, hepatitis, COVID-19, AIDS. Uh, so I'll probably pick one of those and ask you some different questions about it related to, um, related to some of these concepts. Um, you know, usually I'm looking for things that are topical, uh, you know, so like uh, uh, the, the last midterm, I was talking a lot more about treatment and disinfection this time around, um, you know, maybe immune response and things like that too, right? Uh, what kind of key things to know about topics 9 and 10? Topics 9 and 10, that must be on antibiotics and disinfection, I'm thinking. Um, so uh, you definitely want to know about penicillin right? Uh, we talked about penicillin a whole bunch of times and we keep talking about it. So you definitely want to know how penicillin works. Um, always good to know a few examples of things, but I'm not going to ask you lots of the specific nitty-gritty details. Like there won't be any long answer questions about, uh, about uh, disinfecting or sterilizing something, but definitely there will be, uh, you know, a couple of uh, multiple choice questions here or there somewhere. Um, you know, uh, organisms that we kind of covered in the last part. So I might ask you about HIV uh, and how that's treated. Um, and I might, um, you know, any, any sort of, sort of uh, I guess, you, I, I like bigger picture concepts, right, for the earlier units. So for example, uh, I could easily see there being a question asking about what selective toxicity is, right? So that's kind of a, an important concept for, for uh, drugs, right? Um, somebody's asking about, do we need to review the life cycle of HIV? I would take a peek at it. Like I said, for HIV, uh, you know, you should know a little bit about reverse transcriptase and integrase and what those things are doing. Topics 1 to 10 will be multiple choice. Yeah, so I think I had said I pick, you know, I go through all the units and I pick two or three multiple choice from all of them. And then most of the rest of the test will be uh, um, from the later topics. Good questions, keep them coming. Any more questions? So if you have any more questions, um, you do want to email me uh, or contact me during my office hours, that's fine. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can entertain questions then. Uh, someone's asking what time the exam starts, 9 o'clock. I believe that is the case. I don't have that information in front of me, so I'm only partially sure. Um, but uh, uh, it says, somebody asks, uh, what about the scientists from the first topic? Um, it's conceivable I could ask one multiple choice question. I don't know. I have to look through the notes. Uh, kind of the big names, I would say, are Alexander Fleming and Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur. If you're um, for wondering to know. Uh, microscopy. Uh, again, you know, there might be some, some multiple choice questions about microscopy or gram stains or something like that. Uh, you know, probably not the nitty gritty details, but you know, I, you know, I could imagine there being a question, you know, let's say a true or false question saying, uh, you know, viruses could be, can be viewed under a light microscope. And the answer there is false. You need an electron microscope to see a, um, a virus. Someone's saying, did you know if the big chart is going to be fill in the blank or it'll be a drop down box? Um, I'm still working on, on programming that in Moodle, so I'm not sure yet. 
uh, um, it's possible I might have to um, I might have to have uh, basically a, uh, you know the, the table above it and then you have to fill in uh, basically a text box below by just giving me the correct letter A, B, and C and so on. Uh, someone's asking, uh, do we need to know um, the genome of the different types of organisms? Um, no, no, you don't need to know um, what type of genome the different organisms are. I know some people like that kind of information. I personally find it interesting, but uh, I'm not going to ask you, you know, is uh, the flu virus an RNA or DNA virus or something like that. Uh, it says here, the big chart will be on disease, yes. and. Um, uh, I showed you an example in the last class, and I said there will be uh, 10 diseases on it, and it'll have four columns. So disease, organism name, uh, what type of organism is, meaning is it a bacteria, a virus, a protist, or a prion, and then the last one, uh, what body system that it infects. How many matching questions will there be? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, about 10 marks is what I, what I remember. Um, that uh, my plan is. So I'm not sure how many matching questions that will be at the moment. Okay, so I imagine uh, there's not too many other questions. I think I have another cartoon for you here. Uh, maybe I showed you this one already. Abracadabra, command studying to be done, be done. Oh, too bad things weren't so easy, hey? Another question, somebody's asking about life cycles of protists and all those kind of things. Um, most of those things, um, most of those life cycle, cycles kind of have key things about them, right? Uh, you know, focus on things like the transmission part, right, uh, of the life cycle, right? Uh, that, that's important. You know, so if you look at, um, I'm just thinking about, uh, uh, I'm thinking about like the flukes, right? The transmission is you're eating undercooked meat of some sort. Um, swimmer's itch, you know, transmission is, is uh, you know, has something to do with duck feces, right? You know, those kind of things. You know, most organisms, when you, when you do your studying, they have some key things to know about them, you know, transmission or treatment or something like that. And it's kind of hard to kind of an answer on a general sense what's important about which organism. Anyway, I'm going to finish there. And uh, like I said, um, you can always contact me in the future. I will post this recording and uh, I'll post this PowerPoint if I don't get to it right away. If it's not up by the end of the day, please feel free to remind me. Uh, thank you for all your questions this semester and hopefully I will see you around. So best of luck on your finals.